Right, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us um, for this presentation, um, this short webinar on uh, language techniques specifically related to uh, English functional skills. My name is Paul Barber. I'm a functional skills tutor at Circo Education, and we've also got my colleague who's Eamon. Hello, I'm also a functional skills tutor. So, um, in terms of language techniques, what we're going to try and go through in this workshop, this short webinar for you, is to identify and some, understand some of the main points uh, and the ideas about the detail that's within text. Looking at about how you can compare information and, and how people get across, if you like, their ideas and opinions. And the key thing for that we're talking about is the language features, um, that people, how people use language to suit different audiences, and again, to get over different points across. So I'll pass over to Eamon. Perfect. So what is meant by language techniques? Um, language techniques are the element that a writer brings to their writing. So in essence, it could be a story. Um, they emphasize the theme on what they are focusing on. It plays an important factor in writing an essay, a story. Um, it could be a letter, an article, an email or a blog. Language techniques um, and elements can be found anywhere in the text. As a result, it helps students to understand a again story essay article blog letter slash email um in in a better way i think one of the things with language techniques um as you said there amen is eating everything everything we read has got language techniques in and we'll probably yeah. recognize a lot of them when we go through you just may not know the actual name for them and obviously the, the key yeah. thing this being level two functional skills as well as recognizing them hopefully you want to label what they are and also explain what what the benefit or what the use of that is um, so I don't think there'll be much here that people will say, well, I've never heard of that before. They may not have heard the term for it, but we'll hopefully understand what the actual technique is. Yeah, I think I'm like that. I I know what the definition of it is, but when I go back to thinking of what it's actually called, I won't I won't realise. I'm like, oh, yeah, yes, that's what it is. But we'll <laughs> Definitely. <go. laughs> yeah, me too. Um, sorry. That's fine. Um, language techniques and their effects. So language techniques support your writing techniques within your written text. So you'll need to understand the language techniques to develop your actual writing. Once you've identified what language techniques go into your writing, you've hit your level two um, already. So your language, language techniques and their effects help individuals understand the principal factors. So number one, how writers gain impact in their writing. Number two, using various features in your writing to draft your actual writing and then gain the impact. And then number three, to help you meet the criteria where you will explore language and think critically about different types of text. Once you've hit that number three, you're on the high end level two reading, writing for your functional skills. Um, and if you can achieve that straight away, you've achieved your level two qualification. In the English language, you will learn many more language techniques. These techniques are helpful in producing a detailed level of text, for example, an article or a blog. These techniques help us to write in different styles and formats, meaning these are the actual base of our techniques. Great. So we're going to look at some of the actual techniques. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, so how can writers if I don't jump ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so how do writers use language techniques? Number one, uh, descriptive language is a massive one, and we probably don't even realise when we do it. Um, used, it's used to help the reader feel almost as if they are part of the scene or event being described. Description is useful because it helps readers engage with the world of the story or your written text, often creating an emotional response. It can help a reader visualise what a character or a place is actually like. Um, the minute you've hit that descriptive language, is probably more using your imagination. You've hit that again, level two criteria already. Yeah, and that when you say about emotional response, that they're, they're using the, the writers are using that descriptive technique to make you, as you say, to make you think, make you part of the story, part of the picture, feel part of it. And if you think about a book you read, or even just a magazine or a newspaper, anything you read, they'll use the language to try and get you um, involved in the story, so you've got a clear picture of it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I agree. So language techniques. Can you name any language techniques used in descriptive language or give me an example? So an example of a simile is something that is similar. It is like or as something else. So an example of it is they fought like cats and dogs. He's as strong as a bull. So we, do, we won't actually realise what it's called, but we'll definitely know the definition because we use it in day to day life anyway. Yeah, definitely. 
um, bias. Now, this is, I think, a really big one within the level two criteria. Um, so at the simplest level, bias expresses the difference between fact and opinion. Texts are not always so simple. Writers can make a highly opinionated piece appear factual or can choose to present facts and statistics in a selective, biased manner. Learning to spot the bias will make you a careful, critical reader. So you can show inclination or prejudice for or against someone, someone or something. So an example is they were the greatest band of all time. I think one of the things with bias that often people say to me is, is they think bias is that somebody's shown that they're um, a bias towards something, they really like something. But as you put there, it can be against something. So it could be their music is terrible and they're the worst band ever. Um, so it, bias can be one extreme or the other. It can be really positive for something or really against it. But as you put there, it tends to be um, it, it's sort of a, a highly opinionated either one way or the other. But it doesn't just necessarily mean that they're in favour of something. Yeah, but the minute they show that bias in, they can identify bias in text, again, it's your level two criteria in your written text. Yeah, and the other thing that's quite clear is, is one way to often identify bias is if people aren't using facts, so they're just using their opinion, um, like they were the greatest band of all time. But as you put there, you can present facts in certain ways. So they, they say there's, there's statistics and, and can give you three different pictures, and it depends on how they've used that information. So there may be some facts in there, but it's how people yeah. have used those facts or described them that may show bias. Yeah, perfect. I agree with that. So alliteration, this is the letter of, uh, sorry, this is the repetition of a letter sound at the start of a word. So Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. That's very good, well done. <laughs> and now if you ask me to do that again, I probably won't be able to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the waves washed wistfully against the wonderful white shore. So it's the use of repetition of a letter sound at the start of a word. This is a good example of one of those that you, you've probably seen that all the time. And you might recognise that it's repeated a letter, but the actual term for it is alliteration. So when we're talking about, yeah. again, level two functional skills in your test, ideally, yeah. if you see they've used that, and often it's used like that, that bottom one about the waves wash, it just gives you a, a bit more of a flow, it's a bit more poetic. Um, and the word you're looking for to describe that is that it's alliteration, which is one of those words that you may have you may have seen the example, but not heard that word before. Yeah, yeah, of course, that you don't understand what it actually is. Yeah. Perfect. Onomatopoeia. This is my favourite one, and I never remember what it's actually called. <laughs> so this is a word that imitates or suggests the source of the sound that is described. It looks like the sound it makes. So crash, bang, wallop. The cow said moo, the sheep said ba, and the pig said oink. Yeah, definitely. I, and actually, going back to that point about not remembering the word, an onomatopoeia uh, isn't the easiest word to remember and certainly not the easiest word to spell. <laughs> One thing I would say when it comes to tests is if you recognise what it's done, if you recognise they've used a language that um, imitates the sound that it makes and you can't remember the word onomatopoeia, still put that in, still put what it does, maybe put the example in and things like that. And if you can't remember the word, still describe it. Hopefully you will remember the word. Um, we'll send out this, this presentation and, and some sheets and things afterwards as a guide to help you to help you remember but if you do get to testing a mental block and say i remember it was a long word but i can't remember what it was or how to spell it try and describe it anyway because you may get in the test you may get some points and, and marks for doing that um, but hopefully you will remember the word uh, and you'll never forget on a matter piano <laughs> hopefully <laughs> perfect thanks paul so metaphor this is when something is said to be or where something else it's when one thing is compared to an a, another unlike thing so an example is life is like a roller coaster. The classroom was like a zoo. We use these phrases every day when you know that you're teaching, um, I don't know, classroom based, you're doing classroom based learning and you've got 30 learners and they are all running riot. Somebody's walked in, the classroom was like a zoo. That's just describing how everyone was behaving. Um, life is like a roller coaster when things aren't going right um, and it's pulling you from left to right. Again, life is like a roller coaster. It does take you from one end to another. So that's where your use of metaphors does actually come in. Metaphors use a lot, aren't they? You'll, you'll, you'll see those in, in the, now that you know it, uh, now you've heard the term, you'll see it in, in all texts and, and again in blogs and websites and newspapers and magazines and books and, and everything. You'll see metaphors all over the place. They're very commonly used to try. And again, it's about painting a picture to give an emphasis to a point, isn't it? Yeah, of course. And and once you can identify what a metaphor is, um, you'll be using it naturally in all your texts. So yeah. when you've gone and written an example, and then saying it's a metaphor, you'll know it, it's, it'll be like second nature. Yeah, yes, well. Perfect. 
so slang we all use this every day as in conversations on text messages in emails possibly so it's an inf uh, this is informal casual words that are made up and used by cultural groups words that are not part of standard vocabulary or the english language um so examples are bees knees not forced bits and bobs he's a pain in the backside and i know i use that quite a lot <laughs> <laughs> I think, again, it's one of those things that you do use all the time. We do read all the time. But because we're talking now about a qualification, a level two English award, um, it, it's identifying it. So rather than just reading something and thinking, yeah, that was just a comment they made, thinking, actually, why have they used that slang or that colloquialism? And it's usually to, to match with you as the reader. If they're writing like that, it's like they're your friend because they're using uh, a, a, the more relaxed language, if you like. Um, and again, it's to make it a little bit more real. So again, for level two functional skills, what you want to do is you want to be spotting those things and why have they used bits and bobs rather than something more technical terms? Yeah, but it's even like, say for instance, if you've got children at home and you're having a conversation, but you can actually highlight, if they've used some, an example like this in in conversation, you can say, oh yeah, that's, that's a bit of slang right there. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah, and identify it, yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think once you can identify what it is, um, you can use it in your written text naturally. Definitely. Um, this is a very big one, rhetorical mm. question. Um, I think if you can identify what a rhetorical question is and use it in your text from, you can use it at the very beginning, you can use it at the very end, you can even put it in part of your text in the middle as well. So this is a question when you are not expected to answer. It's a figure of speech asked for an effect to emphasise an actual point. So examples of it are, you didn't think I would say yes, did you? Did, uh, do you want to be a success in this world? And are you kidding me? I think once they've, it, for me personally, um, and how I deliver this, is if you open your written text level two with a rhetorical question for your examiner and your marker, they've already seen that you've hit a rhetorical question. That's level two criteria already. So that will carry them through, hopefully, the rest of your text, ticking the rest of the boxes as well for level two. Again, it's something that's used a lot of the time and we're using speech. So we may have done it at the start of this. We may have said, welcome to uh, this thing, this presentation. So what are we going to talk about today? And we're not expecting you to respond to that. It's sort of introducing so then we could tell you what we were going to talk about. So that often is things like, are you kidding me? Are you joking? You don't want a response to that. You don't ideally want somebody to respond when you say, are you joking? Uh, it's more, it's, it's a statement, but posed as a question. And again, very yeah. powerful, very powerful in a written document because it's, it, again, it's making the reader think by asking the reader a question question you're having to think about what you've just read and, and does it make sense or to think about what's coming up and, and to put some questions in put some thoughts in your head to answer that question before you want to read about it yeah very powerful yeah, yeah. i agree right. so personification when something or uh, non-human or even not alive is doing something only humans can do so again we use it all the time in conversations um, I could hear my bed calling me when you're absolutely knackered and you need to get away and go to bed. You use that phrase. I know I've used it that many times. Um, she's so beautiful, the camera loves her. Uh, and the book was so popular, it flew off the shelves. So again, it's just, you probably know the examples, but it's identifying the actual technique used personification. Yeah, um, emotive language. So this is, I think, quite a big one as well. Um, so this is when an adjective or adverb, so you're describing words, I use that relate to refer to emotions to have an emotional impact on the reader and to persuade them. So a defenseless victim was attacked in the cover of the night. Abandoned children found in filthy, fully invested flats. This is Alfie. He was rescued from a yard where he shivered in the cold with no food or water. Alfie was left for dead. Please help Alfie by donating. Now, if you read these kind of texts and there are a few words, automatically you want to car carry on reading. You know, that is that emotive language that's taken the reader to say, actually, there's an impact already. Yeah, spot on. Um, and, and we've said this a few times now, in your reading, when you're reading things, you'll start noticing this. You'll certainly notice it when it comes to functional skills tests, but actually to start using it in your writing rather than just giving simple statements. What other words can you put in there to do the other adjectives to describe things? Um, that will give that bit more motive. And again, it just, it's just a way of, of getting over your points. If you're talking to people, then obviously you can get over your point with your body language and your facial expressions and those things. You can't do that in a written word. So by using more emotive language, you're getting over the thought whether you're really happy about something, really sad about something, or, or whatever it might be, by using those extra adjectives. Yeah. 
Yeah, perfect. I agree. So, an idiom. This is a phrase that does not have its literal meaning. So, get your foot in the door. I think I've used this that many times in my previous job. Um, <laughs> it's when you try and help learners get their foot in the door. So, you have to go and find your first job. And to prove yourself that you can do it, you need to sell yourself. And a lot of people don't understand that. So, we do use that phrase saying, get your foot in the door. The minute you have sold yourself to an employer, you have got yourself through that door. The foot is there. Yeah. So that's where we could use that example. Um, it costs an arm and a leg. So uh, when the kids ask you for, I don't know, a brand new iPad, that is going to cost you an arm and a leg, <laughs> especially with the current climate. <laughs> and ho hopefully you don't mean literally it'll cost you an arm and a leg. <laughs> you never know. No, they can do it. <laughs> uh, don't cry over spilt milk. Uh, and I'm over the moon. So them phrases come under the term idiom. Brilliant. Rule of three. This is when three related words are used together to make an impact. So I would always say, think about your um, traffic light system. So stop, look, listen. That will get you your rule of three already. Uh, beans means hinds. Ready, steady, go. It's quite a common thing, isn't it? Used in again, it's actually used in presentations as well. And actually, uh, you, we've done it there because you've got three examples, and it's it's that three. It's about giving more than two, so that it makes it easier for people to understand. But without giving. 10 things because that gets confusing the rule of three is yeah. quite key and and again looking out for for newspapers are quite good at this they'll give three sort of sharp points that just hammer yeah. hammer something home so yeah yeah perfect repetition i think this is quite a common one that's used but again nobody remembers the term for it mm -hmm. so using the same words or phrases repeatedly to make it clear and mem uh, to make it clearer and memorable so no 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 if you think you can do it, you can actually do it. Work, work and work are the keys to success. So there's yeah. a repetition right there. Yeah, another thing you would read and not even think about it, but hopefully at level two, you're now starting to think, well, actually, they've used that to repetition again to make something even clearer and more memorable. Yeah, of course. I think what it is with all of these um, techniques is they are used in everyday life. Yeah. It's just putting that, that term with the actual technique. And that's one thing. Obviously, a few times we refer to the functional skills tests and awards, and ultimately that's what it comes down to. But actually, as you say, they're used in everyday life, so don't feel you have yeah. to wait and it has to be done in a test. Again, next time you pick up a leaflet for something or you see an advert, have a look. Have they used the rule of three? Have they used some idioms in there? Have they put a rhetorical yeah. question, which adverts are quite good at? They put a question onto you to make you think about their product. So just start looking for some of these things and trying to label them. Yeah, of course. Um, so another one is oxymoron. Um, this is when two words are used together that have opposite meanings, so they contradict one another. So act naturally, seriously funny, uh, near miss, same difference. And again, it's you you will be using these every day. And if you have got children, you'll probably be using them with them in conversations. But I would suggest if you do have kids, once you have identified, oh, they've just said something, throw the technique at them. So it pushes <laughs> them off. Board. Oh, they're just using oxymoron. <laughs> Yeah, and then that way, I think once you've got that level of engagement with um, somebody like in real life, you'll understand the technique as well a bit better rather than just reading it and trying to remember it. So great. Thanks very much for that, Eamon. Um, so there were lots of techniques we've gone through there. And again, we appreciate that one of the hardest things that you, as you're looking through there, hopefully most of them you're going, oh, yeah, I recognize that. I understand that. Um, maybe remembering them and trying to put them into, um, again, trying to remember the actual term is, is the difficult thing. But we will send out this recording and the, the presentation that goes with it and some sheets and things to have a look. And, and again, that's myself and Eamon are there to support you if you have got any questions about any of those techniques. Perfect. Thanks very much, Eamon. Thanks, everybody.